Welcome everybody to Mind Rolling, and uh, I'm here with a very special new friend, because I know it, mostly because Rosemary, I mean, Rosemary's last name is Traumer, but uh, that beautiful other word, what's what's the thing that you use on the site? Mm-hmm. Watola, Rosemary Watola Trauma. And Watola is my maiden name. It's Finnish. No, but um, the, the, the wordsmith or... Oh, word woman. Word woman, that's it. Yeah. Well, I like that. <laughs> she's, my, she's my superhero self. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Rosemary is a, a poet that I just discovered, and I'm completely enamored and have been spoken to so directly, that's why I feel, yes, I do know you. Oh, God. Uh, I don't even know where to start, but we're going to start with uh, how, how, you, how did you embody into this, uh, what I would call, um, uh, so exacting a fulfillment of a dharma of, of an incarnation? Oh, heavens, I don't even know how to answer that. <laughs> I like the word embodiment. I can say that mm-hmm. I do think that I've been lucky enough to move in a daily way into a more embodied way of being. I think we could say that, that, that and especially through a poetry practice, that by writing poems every day for the last 15 years, it's changed everything about the way that I meet the world and everything about the way that I show up mm. and meet the world, yeah. Before actually we go anywhere, this is like, for me, music is a huge part of my life. I, I had a indie label some time back and it's always been that way for me. And so whenever I talk to a musician, I go, wait a minute, I can't talk to you anymore. i got to play a song so people really know what we're, <laughs> we're talking about, right? So do you, I mean, I would, lo- hopefully you have some of your poetry books around so I can call on you to, to read. Yeah. But uh, can I read the first one? Because this is what got me, okay? I just happened, I don't know where I found it, whatever. Now I'm, uh, Rosemary does a wonderful thing, by the way, and we're going to give you all the linkage in the show notes on the podcast page. But you can get a poem a day. It's like we send out Ram Dass's words of wisdom every day. There's some other quote from him. People, you know, helps to set their day. Well, this is no more or no less it has done it for me. I mean, I'm so happy to get those poems every day. Mm. And, uh, okay, so I'm going to read this first one. Forgive me, please, when I, thrilling in how much I love you, believe you belong to me, like a book or shirt or a ring. Writing that short list, it now seems strange. I believe I own anything. I know well the unstitching of loss. Let me learn to love you loosely the way I love mourning the way I love song, the way I love hawks on the wing. Let me love you the way I love poems, startled and grateful each time I find it is I who belongs to them. That's pretty great. I mean, you can be objectively say that's pretty great, even though you were... (laughs) (laughs) You know, what's, what's lovely about hearing someone else read it, I really do, I forget them almost immediately after I write them. Mm. So mm. it's a gift you just gave me to bring that poem back, which I wrote maybe just last week. Um, last and, week? Really? Well, yeah. It was one of the, so. oh, right, one of the daily poems. And I, and right, it's a, a week or two ago. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. It wasn't long ago. And, the, and then it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's sweet because there's enough of a distance that I can meet it again in a new way, mm. which is fun, too. Oh, Thank you great. for reading it. It was beautiful to hear your voice. Thank you. Uh, okay, so a little bit more about uh, how you came to be formed and how you really did follow a path here and when you knew about it. You know, I'm curious. 
Well, the, so I began writing poems when I was quite young and it began as a play practice. It really was just fun, right? I loved Shel Silverstein. I, I, I used to sit on the couch with my grandmother and read her the whole book. She would just sit with me for hours and let me read to her. And I do think that play was the was this entrance point for me with language. And and over many years then, of course, I and then I fell in love with Shel Silverstein, I mean with E.E. E. Cummings. And then after E.E. E. Cummings came Gerard Manley Hopkins. So I had maybe a history of of falling in love with poets who met language in a fresh way and met and used language as a way not just to express emotion but to to engage in the world with with pleasure it's i think the reason that i still write every day is because there is no matter how difficult no matter how painful the subject is there is still this pleasure in showing up and seeing what happens and it used to be so scary right i used to be so afraid of a blank page you know, if I wasn't going to do a good job, and it was it was like a test each time I sat down. And now it feels more like I get to meet this blank and hang out with blank for a while, and then see what blank. shows up with blank. It's so thrilling because every time something happens, right? Something happens each time, and it was Raghu was this daily practice that changed things that allowed me to take it from thinking that it was about creating a product a good product, right? And and step aside from that and think that the, the most important part was this play, was this showing up, was this meeting the blank, was seeing what happened over and over and over. And the promise that I eventually started to make to myself when I sat down was, it does not have to be good, but it has to be true. It has mm -hmm. to be true. And once I shift that, small paradigm shift changed everything about my relationship to poetry but even more exciting than it changed everything about my relationship to the world right it, it this little this sweet little microcosm this little practice of showing up on a page translated directly to can i can, if i can trust what it is that that life will show up when i sit down to, to write can i trust life when I'm parenting my child, can I trust life when I'm angry with my partner? Can I trust life when I'm scared of whatever? You know, so it it's a it really stopped being about poems. Mm. Isn't that funny? Like I, I I always call the poems the happy byproduct of this other kind of gorgeous wrestling that shows up and 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 I never know what'll happen. It's like magic, right? It's like real magic every time. Mm. There was nothing. And now there's something. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm just reminded because as you describe this, uh, it, it reminded me of a friend uh, who works with us and does retreats and has been for the last few years, Anne, Anne Lamott. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's a, a, the way that you connect with, through the poem is, very similar to the way that she connects through her writing. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. to, uh, she, I'm gonna, she, I'm gonna, we got to send her a book. She would love your poetry if she doesn't oh, already well, have. I'd be delighted to send her one or two. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, Annie, if you're listening. <laughs> well, what really is amazing to me is the way in which uh, many of these poems and, and some of the ones that I've, I've chosen, they speak to a deep uh, investigation mm -hmm. of who we are. And you just said, said that in reference to the world, but, but I know that you really um, are committed to the exploration of self, other, and mm -hmm. so on. And but that just didn't pop up. So there must be a little bit something there else is, going on here. There's more. Thank you for digging. So the poems, the poems became a practice, right? But even in the beginning of this practice, I still thought for even a decade, perhaps, that, well, not quite that long, that the poems could be used to contain things that I could use a poem just to take the messy world and organize it a little bit better. 
uh, I really believed it, <laughs> which I laugh at now. I, I, I even taught workshops on that. Mm-hmm. And then, and then uh, my world fell completely apart. I had a, a very difficult mm, chapter in which most things I thought I knew about who I was and how the world worked fell away. Now, at this time, I also was practicing. Uh, I've been sitting satsang with a woman named Joy Sharp for about oh, 10, 11 years now. And she and I had been working together then at that point for at least five years. So that when things really fell apart, she had already given me, in my head, I could say, I want to say yes to the world as it is. It was a, an idea that I could get on board with. But it wasn't an embodied experience, right? And I really think that it took this this period of feeling like I was literally, it felt like I was falling. It felt like I was falling for weeks, for weeks. Just I'd wake up and I was already falling and Mm. falling and falling and falling and falling. It was a strange and at, at the time deeply disorienting experience. Was it it as a result of, of, uh, sorry, I'm just wondering, was it as a result of some incident that triggered this? uh, It was. It was a a very difficult time with, uh, in my marriage. Uh And it it was unsettling enough that I, I, I just felt like I lost all anchors. I lost all tethers. I lost everything I thought I knew about how the world was and who I was in the world. And at the time, and I, I often think, who would ask for this? Who would ask to be broken open in that way? No, nobody wants their life to completely fall apart. That's so counterintuitive. And yet, <laughs> what a gift that was. Mm, that, yeah. that it was like I was, honestly, it was as if I were remade in that mm. time. And, and I don't know when I stopped falling. But I remember that I, I, around this time, I lost my fear of the dark. I, I, like so many things that had been frightening, terrifying for me before, um, I, I could embrace completely. I fell deeply in love with nothing, with nothing, nothing. Yeah, that's a that great poem you made too, and even now, which I oh, just many, read before. Yeah, oh, so many nothing poems. <laughs> I've read no, nothing there's a lot of nothing now. poems. Yeah. Well, those are my favorite poems, Rosemary. I, uh, I love that you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or here it is, blowing all the wishes off the dandelion, falling in love with nothing. That's great. That is so great. So in love with that nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And now I think that 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 the change, if you if you read the earlier books, like it was it's even obvious in the titles. You can tell where it comes in the books. The book right before that was called Holding Three Things at Once. And the book right after that was called The Less I Hold. <laughs> and and you can so it's even kind of there in the titles that 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 there was some kind of a remaking of how I thought about everything and most certainly how I felt about meeting a page and how it went from being something that I thought I could organize and fix things to an experience of unlearning and shedding layers of self and really opening up to, like I said earlier, what is the next true thing I could say, which could be enough and is, I don't know. I don't know. And and just really letting myself lean into that uncertainty and falling in love with that. Yeah. So Ramdas put it a different way, that that kind of an incident that precipitates something just so awful, just tremendous suffering. And then there's a way in which transformation happens that would not have happened without mm-hmm. that. Suffering brings me closer to God, is what he used to say. Mm-hmm. What our um, guru would talk to, uh, just mention these kinds of, of things uh, to us occasionally here and there. And mm-hmm. that was one of them. And it's how do you manage, of course, to surrender to that 
how do you manage to bring in that suffering and make a little bit of a friend? And th mm -hmm. I think there's a you, there's one wonderful poem. I don't know if I can find it, but, uh, but we could be sitting here for hours reading these poems. I mean, they they really uh, speak in a certain way. I hope everybody. I mean, we're you'll all be able to to get uh, in instant gratification because Rosemary is so generous with her sharing. And um, but yeah, you spoke to that about. Uh, I think it was a, f a poem around fear, actually. Um, Anyhow, yeah, I, and then, and then, after. <laughs> and then, um, I think several things that have happened in terms of a poetry practice for me, one of them is, I think, the, the joy of giving it away, you know, the joy of having, creating this blog in which just every day I do what often people think is a crazy thing. You, they're like, you put your first drafts into the world every day. And that's exactly yeah, what I do, yeah, yeah. and it's a that's um, courageous. Well, that's a that's a generous word to use for it. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people think it's um, maybe ill advised, but but the yeah. the thrill of it for me is that that it opens up this beautiful conversation with other people, right? So every day I put it into the world, and every day I get people who write me back and say that was the poem and they have this mm. it, it's so it i feel always in resonance because of it i think because there it becomes a big i always think of poetry as the big conversation right the poem that i'm having that i'm writing the poems that i've been reading that are fueling me and then sharing these poems with the world and receiving it back it's just like this giant you know mm. inhale exhale mm -hmm. i always just think it's so mm. gorgeously reciprocal and so that's been a huge part of this practice too, is just that giving them away and mm -hmm. seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been, it's lovely. There's um one of the poems, I thought maybe I'd share this with you. One of the poems at the time, the poem that I feel like saved my life is this poem by Rilke, You Darkness, and the version I love best by Robert Bly. And it's You Darkness That I Come From. I love you more than all the fires that fence in the world. For the fire makes a circle of light for everyone, but then no one outside learns of you. But the darkness pulls in everything, shapes and fires, animals, and myself. How easily it gathers them, powers and people, and it is possible a great energy is moving near me. I have faith in nights. It's the, um, mm. I say it every day, I'm sure I say that. It just comes, it just shows up. And it's so amazing to me the way that, you know, Rilke, who almost, his parents sent him to military school, right? He almost, he didn't, he didn't know he'd become a writer and, and all things looked as if he wouldn't, but then he did. And he wrote that poem and it came to me through, through a singer actually. And then the, I got that poem and then it, it saved me. Right. So I just know the, the depth of the mm. conversation that happens mm. across continents, across centuries and how poetry fosters this uh, ability to to know each other, to know what does it mean to be alive, and to uh, in, ignite these epiphanies in us. Mm. Uh, it's just thrilling to be part of that big conversation. Yeah. So we're talking about that momentous uh, moment for you around some tremendous suffering, and that kind of changes it birthed and. I don't know if you, ha I mean, if you have something that connects with this idea that uh, I know uh, is is really important that you have certainly thought about, and um, and that's the idea of how we shy away from anything uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and the preferences that we have are so strongly. I mean, I, I'm, you know, and I'm saying this stuff <laughs> and yeah you know, i've been doing this for decades right and the getting to that 
place of being comfortable with discomfort, mm-hmm. boy, that's that's a, a, a big toughie. And but it is part of the being able to uh, allow suffering to be. So, do do you have a poem that solves that one? Oh, that solves it? Heavens no, friend. <laughs> Okay, no, point. Point. I do. I do have a poem that meets it. Uh, just a moment. It might take me a second to find it, but it won't. It won't yeah, no, take no problem. Yeah, to talk about. I want it solved now, and uh, <laughs> well, perhaps we can meet up. Who do we all? Who do we all? Let's see. Making yeah, and up. and you've spoken about it before around the art of uh, changing metaphor, and to me that's very much like um, how, in one sense, it's quite available to pivot from one perspective to another, mm-hmm. out of the perspective of being lost in belief of all thoughts and stories of oneself. And that little pivot allows for some spaciousness around the fact, okay, human, what are you going to do? It's okay. You know, that kind of a tone <laughs> with ourselves rather than this, you know, hu- the judge and jury is so loud, the Greek chorus is unbelievable. So, yeah, uh, the art of changing metaphor. The art of changing metaphor is enormous. And and that is, you know, I have that TEDx talk about that, about what it is to notice. I mean, just even to notice that we have a metaphor in place, that there is something yeah. that we're defining ourselves by, right? You know, the my favorite example is when my friend said to me, I said to my friend, actually, I feel like I'm being tested. You know, my son had been screaming for a year. He was colicky. I think I'm being tested. And she said, oh, Rosemary, it's not a test it's a path. It was so beautiful in mm. that moment, right? It was like a ding. You know, I love hiking. I love hiking hard. I love hiking steep. I want to I want to do the hardest path. And I thought, wow, I got the hardest path as a mother. Mm. And it's not like it got easier then. No. No. But it did. <laughs> no, no, it was still hard. My baby still screamed every day. But the way I could meet that, the way I met that screaming was 100% different. Uh-huh. And that, that, you know, I think it's not, can we love that suffering? I don't know that we can, but I think we can love meeting the suffering. We can love being broken open wholly that way. I do think that the, the one of the, the biggest gifts, there's so many biggest gifts, by the way. I'm always a little too superlative. But the biggest gift of of writing poems is that they allow that spaciousness that you were talking about so that when we bring something very difficult, a death, a loss to the page, there's an inherent beauty in the poem making itself that allows us to meet deep suffering with beauty. And um, and there's a softening in the, that happens in that, a tenderness available in that, that I think allows that meeting to happen in a in an authentic way without trying to shy away from it. But we can also meet it, as Emily Dickinson says, my business is circumference, right? We don't have to go straight into the difficult thing. We can go around it and around it and around it and allow for that ripening process to happen and so that, that we're not necessarily overwhelmed by it all at once. We can meet it at, a, at our own pace as we move. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, here's a, here's a poem about about this suffering and meeting that suffering, just as you were saying. And it starts with a quote from the Wizard of Oz. Um, the Wizard of Oz says to the the woodsman, "Hearts will never be practical until they can be made unbreakable." And I just I love that line because I I think it's so completely wrong. <laughs> It's, it's so off base, wizard. Uh, and <laughs> and if I can't love the suffering, I can at least ask to be able to meet it in in the most engaged way. So that's what this poem is about. Making the ask. Give me a heart that breaks. A heart that longs to open 
wider and wider, always revealing more space. Give me hands that long to serve. Make them strong enough to build what must be built. Make them fall in love with letting go. Make them unable to hurt. Give me a mind that leans toward generosity, a tongue that speaks in only we, feet that run toward those in need, eyes that see behind, beneath the mask, ears that hear the silence that is the staff for every sound, a nose that follows the fragrance of truth, blood the same red as everyone else's. And give me a heart that breaks again and again, the way ocean waves break, unpredictable, an endless breaking, an endless release, in which nothing is ever really lost, in which we are found. Mm. Mm. Reminds me of my fellow Montrealer, Leonard Cohen. Ah. Right, how without the crack in the heart, the light yeah. cannot come through. Yeah, right. and who wants it? Who would ask for it, you know? And and yet that's what this poem is yeah. saying, I suppose, is let me be courageous enough to ask for it, to, to, to want to meet the world that openly, even if I fail, hmm. even, if, even if I really can't do it, but I'd like to want to. Yeah, and by the way, just to, I don't want people to think Ramdas walked around going, I love suffering. Just where is it? I think. <laughs> okay. It is a superlative. First of all, love itself, that word is a difficult thing. It's uh, more about a business deal, usually, even in roman you know, romantic life. And and his his thing of it was exactly how you describe it and how how it is uh, in the poem, and that's about meeting suffering in a place where you're not running away. Mm -hmm. Just start there. You know, that's uh, the, the beauty, as Sharon Salzberg says, you can start over every moment, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's, it is, uh, I love meeting is a good word for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's an interesting thing, too, because when I, it took, what, many, many years for me to trust meeting a blank page, right? To really trust that I would show up and the blank would show up and something would happen. And and then uh, it's only recently I've, I've really understood how important trust is in the creative process mm. to trust that that it that the right whatever I do there's as I like to say there's so many ways to do it right so I don't get caught up in the idea that there was one right way and I have not found it so many ways to do it right and trust that that will happen trust that I can meet a moment and that that's all I have to do and what's so sweet my my teacher Joy who I mentioned earlier this just this last week I was struggling with something around my son and she says can you can you trust life? And I said, no, no, I can't. It's, I need to fix this. This is not okay at all. And it was so beautiful, so amazing to, to meet that moment when I said, no, I cannot trust life. And think, oh, wow, look at that. And mm -hmm. see the invitation in it. Because it's true. I mean, it was very true. There was no way I could trust life in that moment. But to notice the not trusting, I could get a little closer to meeting life again, right? And and yeah. there come yeah. then the more I could notice it, the more I could breathe, and then comes the spaciousness. And, yeah. Um, and having had that experience, then through this poetry practice, it's it's it, there's a sweet translation. It's almost like a, oh, there it is. That's it. I know that. I know. I know what it is to let go of that feeling. Like, but it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. And oh. That little release, that oh, poems love that release. I mean, it's one of the most exciting parts of writing a poem is at that moment of, oh, and it usually comes when you face the thing that you didn't want to face. 
Mm. Oh, that there it is. Yeah. Mm. This thing of the practice for you that the have uh, have you um, do you do any other practices or you know around spiritual practices or whatever or if, has everything centered into this daily practice, which is no more or less than any other practice. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if what else has informed what comes through you in terms of maybe, you know, I mean, in my case, it's all about, you know, I was interested in Eastern, Eastern spirituality. So off I went after I met Ramdas and I, India is so much part of my blood. I've been, I've lived, I don't even know, I mean, every year, I was, this last year, it's the first time in a long time that I haven't gone there. So, yeah, where where is that in your um, experience? Mm -hmm. uh, so, certainly the work I've been doing with Joy, like I said, you know, I talk to her every two weeks, every three weeks or so, and that's been a constant for me for, for you know, 10, 12 years now. Mm. Then, the other thing is, I suppose, just being outside every day. I go for a walk every day, not at the same time. It's, it's, it could be any, you know, and it's not the same place, but going outside. I've had a very success, unsuccessful, um, sitting practice where I, my, my cats are much better at sitting on my cushion than I am. It's always covered <laughs> in cat hair. <laughs> and yet, and yet, it's a beautiful thing. I, I teach these uh, meditation and poetry workshops with a beautiful Dharma teacher. Her name is Susie Harrington. Hmm. And and we had met each other at a spirituality festival where we were both speaking. And she came up to me afterward and she said, you, you just gave a Dharma talk. You know, hmm. I had been reading poems and talking about writing and poetry. And, and so I went to her talk and we thought, what if we got together and did this? And really... Oh noticed how the gorgeous paradox right of how both poetry and words language and silence both allowed us to touch the present to meet what's here right and one of and how just right isn't it that they would be completely opposite modalities and yet take us onto the same path so that that was a really beautiful discovery about five six years ago we've oh. been leading retreats together ever since really oh that's lovely Wow. I mean, definitely. Uh, well, one thing, An Anne Lamott has come to a few retreats and taught mm -hmm. a couple of writing workshops. Actually, there was uh, one other gentleman, a long, long-term friend of ours named Robert Thurman, who's a Buddhist mm -hmm. uh, uh, practitioner and uh, close friend of the Dalai Lama. That's Robert's claim to fame. And a, and a brilliant man, and they hadn't really met before. And I don't know if you've ever, Robert Thurman can give a talk where you're riveted for an hour and two hours. I mean, he's just extraordinary, right? And But he had never met, and I don't even think he had read Anne's work or anything, but met there. He was in the middle of finishing a book, Robert, at the retreat in Maui. And he got an inspiration from just sitting at her writing workshop or mm -hmm. something. And he rattled off the end of this book. He was basically, from that moment on, he was her devotee. You know, they did a thing <laughs> together that is worth <laughs> the price of admission kind of a thing. And um, uh, just the, the way in which two completely disparate experiences uh, of people and what they had in their lives, you know, Annie, you know, Christian-based and... Um, and wise, and Robert, who went to um, India and met the Dalai Lama, but he needed to be able to, he didn't speak English that well at that time. Robert learned Tibetan in 60 mm -hmm. days, oh my reading goodness. and writing, okay? Who wow. the hell could do something like that? <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, to s talk about coming from two different places and the way they they meet this was so so much of that really so much of and that. that's that is i think one of the other most glorious things po poetry brings right is this uh mandate i suppose to honor paradox right to hmm. to not the but but the and you know to in the dark and the light 
the pain and the joy, you know, how, how hand in hand they always are. And, and poetry in its beautiful, finite space always creates room for them both. In fact, longs for it. In fact, begs for them to mm. both be there. Yeah. God, I have all power these Power to the paradox. Yeah, power to the paradox. My friend Jack always said that. I love that. We should make a t-shirt about that. Uh, my co-host is here making a little bit of noise. She's on the floor. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so there, wait, there is a poem. Maybe you can find, if you can't find it, then I'm going to read it. Okay. Okay. Right. It's, I don't know the name, unfortunately, somehow my, but it starts, and, and when fear comes to the door, bringing flowers. Does that oh, ring I'm a bell? I'm sure I couldn't find it. Yeah. Even that alone is worth <laughs> It's so great. Fear is at the door, bringing flowers. Oh, is it strange wish? Maybe no. acting as if it's no. a friend. <laughs> I should have. Is it a recent poem, do you know? I, I saw it on your site, but... Oh, um, well, I can look it up there. That's easy. Yeah. And when fear comes to the door, bringing flowers. I tell you, it is a really good thing that I have uh, this website because I am a terrible organizer of my work, and the mm -hmm. website does it for me. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> Helps me find it. Perfect. There it is. It's called Staying Home. Staying Home. Okay, yeah. go. Here we go. Staying Home. And when fear comes to the door, bringing flowers, acting as if it's a friend, it's okay to not want to let it in. It's okay to lock the door. It'll make you feel as if you're doing something. Fear will enter anyway. At least it won't expect a hug. It won't wash its hands, not even when you ask nicely. And it is more contagious than any virus. Spreads without sneezes or coughs. It won't leave when you ask. But there are ways to make it quieter. Like inviting a few others to join you, preferably gratitude, compassion, love, kindness, vulnerability. These friends always come when asked, wearing the loveliest perfume. They change the conversation the way lemon and honey change the bitter tea. They remind you who you are, invite you to look out the window and see how beautiful the world when the shadows are long Mm. Love that. Rosemary. There's a, a little bit of that Rilke in there, isn't there, at the end yep. with the beautiful long shadows, you darkness yep. that I come from, I love you. Yeah. But I like, uh, it's it's more contagious than any virus, really. <laughs> oh, do we not know that now, everyone? Oh, we the know. Fear. Boy. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, so this again, I, I keep I guess I keep going back to what my experience is in the East and all in and in terms of the kinds of metaphors we're talking about. But you know, inviting gratitude, compassion, love, kindness, and vulnerability, that is no more or less uh, the His Holiness the Dalai Lama has given talks saying exactly that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it as uh, Neem Karoli Baba would say to us, sub ek only one there's only one thing going on it's all one all one mm. so that's uh, such a such of the the beauty of uh, the potential transformation of how words have that effect is uh, is really quite powerful but uh yeah oh i was just gonna say i, I, I was just thinking about that today about paths just like you said, and I was thinking about <laughs> being on separate paths with someone and thought, no, they're, 
there's really only one path. There's just one path. And it, it helped me to think of it that way. Yeah. Metaphor coming alongside to help me out. <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> but the practice thing, I mean, you using this as a practice and um that's never been a practice of mine. I mean, I am like I got as I mentioned Leonard Cohen, but I got turned on really by Len Leonard Cohen in, mm -hmm. in in terms of I can't remember that I was, you know, gravitated in school. You know, I'm sure there was poems in some part, but I was the worst student and hated school every 24-7. So that didn't really reach me. Um, but uh, Leonard did, mm -hmm. and that opened up a door. But I, I've never had it, uh, seen it as for myself as a practice. Um, can take us through that process where mm -hmm. it, it it you know how you are relating with it as a practice and how people who are listening, many of you I'm sure, um, can can hear something about how this also can provide a path mm -hmm. to uh, inner knowledge, mm -hmm. just as simple as that, knowing oneself. Well, it began as a, an invitation from a friend. She suggested writing a poem every day for 30 days, which at the time sounded absolutely impossible. Like I couldn't even imagine that I could write a poem every day for 30 days. She suggested you get two friends so that there's an accountability and one friend will flake out. So you need to have three of you. <laughs> and then and you commit to just sending each other the poems every day. You don't have to comment on them. And that was how it began. And we began on the equinox and then we went through and we started, uh, we went all the way then to the solstice. We did, we decided after 30 days, let's do 90. So we did 90 days and then my friend stopped, but I never stopped because of noticing exactly this, that it wasn't so much anymore about the page, but about how it changed the way I was meeting the world. And over time, I came to these four promises um, that I like to recommend to anybody who would like to start a writing practice. And that is, um, well, here they are. Number one, I will write. That's pretty easy. That's it. Well, I will write. Number two is what I've already mentioned. It doesn't have to be good, but it has to be true. And just noticing that perfectionist part of me that, that cringes when I worry what is it going to be any good is it going to be any good and how that gets in the way it's so natural right it's so human to want something to be good uh and then and then we get that gorgeous of course line from mary oliver you do not have to be good which no one has ever told us before but there's a, that's such an important piece of this is just letting go of that perfectionist and knowing that if i could write the next true thing then it will have resonance and if it has resonance then people will say oh that's good but you can't start there <laughs> The third thing is I can't know the ending when I start. If I do, I have to write past it or write a separate ending, right? You know, like multiple endings. And I feel like that one is so important because it is what allows me to be certain that I'm letting the poem know more than I do. There's a, it's a, it's fundamentally different to think I'm, I'm imparting my wisdom on the page versus I'm meeting the poem and it will guide me. It knows it knows what comes next. And that way, I'm always surprised, right? There's always a surprise. Every time I sit down, I don't know what will happen. Uh, if you do know what's going to happen, it's like my friend Catherine says, it's like creating an emergency exit that you can get out. So I always think you gotta honor, honor the poem by letting it being in service to it. And then the last piece, like I mentioned, is that I will share that poem. And it doesn't have to be on a blog, for heaven's sakes. You don't have to put it out for the whole world. That's a pretty vulnerable thing to do, but but to to know that giving back to the world what was given to us is a vital, important part of this practice. So those four things, I think, have have really shaped how I meet it every day, just over and over and over. Those four things. Mm -hmm. And how, um, in a, in a more general way do they inform just that exploration of self, of other, of mm -hmm. the ground of truth? 
Mm -hmm. So let's say that, um, like one of my favorite ways to start is just to start with like a fact, like something from science, right? Like the other year ago or so I read that on earth, a teaspoon of neutron star would weigh 6 billion tons. I'm like, whoa, like oh. 6 billion tons, a teaspoon. <laughs> and I'm wow. And, and then I decide I'll marry a fact like that with an emotional experience. Um, in this case, um, I'll share a poem with you that came up out of this where there's this, like I said, this trust that if we take a fact of the world and we take of the outer world, right? And then we take a experience of the inner world. So if we start with something concrete and then we start with also something experiential, what a feeling, an emotion, an idea, a question. And we let those two talk to each other. There will always be a conversation there. And, I, and that's what the poem allows for, right? So when I took this fact about the neutron star and I married it with grief, with the thought of my friend grieving, um, here's the poem that, that showed up. It's called, While well, Watching My Friend Pretend Her Heart Isn't Breaking. <laughs> On Earth. Just one teaspoon of neutron star would weigh six billion tons. Six billion tons is the equivalent of every animal on earth, including the insects, times three. Six billion tons sounds impossible until I consider what it is to swallow grief. Just one teaspoon, and one may as well have consumed a neutron star, how dense it is, how it carries inside it the memory of collapse, how difficult to move that, how impossible to believe anything could ever lift that weight. There are many reasons to treat each other with great tenderness. One is the sheer miracle that we are together on a planet surrounded by dying stars. And another is none of us can see what anyone else has swallowed. Mm. Fantastic. It, it's a sweetness that happens over and over when we just agree to marry what's happening in the world outside of us with the world inside of us. And then poetry builds the bridge between those two worlds and allows them to have a conversation so that we are able to have this bringing in the body and bringing in the the heart, the soul, the mind and letting them braid, letting them connect and see what they have to say to each other. Hmm. How do you deal with self-consciousness? No, I don't, and I'm meaning how does one deal uh -huh. with self-consciousness? And, and that can take so many different forms of, um, Gee, this isn't sophisticated enough. Oh boy, this is just what am I copying? I must be remembering something. I how do you uh -huh. deal with all that? You second guessing. Yeah. This is this is it. This is this is it goes back to that it doesn't have to be good, but it has to be true, right? If I trust that I have said the truest thing that I can say, if I know that I've met that moment. Not because I'm trying to sound clever. Because if I try to, it, nobody cares about clever. Nobody cares about clever. When we read a poem, we want to be moved. We want a mirror. We want to see what does it mean to be alive. And so the only way to touch that is by talking to the truth of our experience. And if I know that what I've written is true, then, then I've done it, right? Then I've done it. If, if somebody may or may not like it, but it really isn't about them. If I've been true to myself in that process and I've unlearned or learned or shucked or shedded or those aren't even words, but but if I've done that crazy letting go process, uh, if someone else doesn't like it, they don't have to. Like it did the work for me, right? <laughs> it would, it's a little selfish in a way, I suppose, but it's it's the sweetness that comes from trusting the self. 
and I suppose it just happens over time, right? And and what I'm lying if I say that I don't ever wouldn't I love people to think that they were good? It doesn't it feel great when you ragu say, I have this poem, this poem, it really it it really touched me. And I'm like, yes, awesome. I said it feels great. Mm. But I but I didn't write it for you in a way, right? Like I wrote that poem to t- to explore, to be wrestled, to to experience, and then mm. and then in that spirit of of truth, right? Give it away. It's great if you love it, but mm. I'll keep writing them even if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And therein it's is hard. the, yeah. and therein is is the exploration, yeah. and therein is the practice. Right? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's great, great. Now I also know that you, um, in I guess workshops, seminars, whatever, uh, you tie this to creativity. So uh, you know, everyone in my mind has a creative um, part of them that oh, they may ignore, or they may run from, or they may be in fear of, or they may be a little too enamored of. Uh, but yeah, let's, <laughs> I want to hear from you around uh, you know, creativity and, um, and the inspiration that really is profoundly connected with one's life mission, dharma. Well, here's the, I do believe that every single person can write a poem. And, um, you know, when people say, oh, no, I, you know, my, my pat response is, can you write a list? <laughs> so many of my favorite poems are just lists, things that plume, things that open, <laughs> you know, like it's a, it's a, that, that, you know, making me ask poem that I read earlier, that was just a list of ways that I'd like to be open to, you know, and to meet the world, mm. just a list. Um, Do I really think everyone can benefit from writing poems? I guess I really do. But I also really believe that people are going to benefit from whatever it is they're called to. And and I believe that that a daily practice of whatever that is, right? If it's dancing, if it's painting, in that, in that, in a practice where we're meeting it again and again and again and again, we we basically wear ourselves down. Like the, we eventually write, we realize that we're gonna write. How many moon poems have I read? I have written a thousand poems about the moon. Have I ever gotten it right? Not once. Not <laughs> once. So will I write a thousand more poems about the moon? Of course I will. You know, because I'll just keep trying. It's that bit, my business's circumference. I'll just keep circling and circling and circling it. I think that the it does take, I don't think it takes talent. I think I'm proof of that. I don't think that I was any great literary talent to start, but I loved poetry, right? I loved it. So I had devotion and I am stubborn as heck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I was just like, well, I'm just going to do it and I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it. So I think that devotion and stubbornness are way more important than talent. And mm. and that goes a long way toward creativity, that. right? Mm. Devotion and stubbornness. Yeah, I gotta write yeah. that down. That's something to explore more. <laughs> Since our whole path is about bhakti yoga and stubbornness. Yeah. Yeah, it's helped me out. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's probably yeah. kicked me down a few times too, but it's helped me out. All right. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, think of the times that we've been in in the last year, or thinking about that, and um, the there's uh, one of your poems. I want to read it now. Can I read it? It makes me very happy to hear you. <laughs> uh, I love actually reading poetry, and uh, so uh, I don't. Unfortunately, I lost the name of this poem again. Um, but um, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, it is so f- deeply referential to what we have been going through, and uh, and I, I really appreciate it on on that uh, score. So just two weeks ago, it was sufficient to say hello, good morning, goodbye, 
But now, in every text, every email, every phone call, I tell my friends and family how much I love them. I tell them life is better because they are in it. I say it with the urgency of a woman who knows she could die, who knows this communication could be our last. I slip bouquets into my voice. I weave love songs into the spaces between words. I infuse every letter, every comma with prayers. Sometimes it makes me cry, not out of fear, but because the love is so strong. How humbling to feel it undiluted, shining like rocks in the desert after a rain, to know love as the most important thing, to remember this as I keep on living. Mm -hmm. That is... Um, is that not deeply connected to what we have all been going through this last year? I mean, I'm so this is how it's hitting me. I don't, how did it hit you when you wrote Oh, it? I, re I remember now writing that one at the, toward the beginning of the pandemic. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it was, you know, weren't we all instantly very aware of our own death, right? You know, memento mori, that whole stoic ideal that I... You know, I deeply fell in love with Marcus Aurelius a couple of years ago, and that whole notion of how we we could die any moment, and suddenly it was so real for the whole world at the same time. Yeah, yeah. There was a real beauty in that, as horrible as horrible and terrifying as it was, it was also a, a laying us bare, a vulnerability, and unmasking that. You know, the, there was that moment for, <clears throat> excuse me, that moment for a while when I was, I was really ready for a ma uh, like a major global leap in consciousness. I was like, wow, we're all going to get it at the same time. <laughs> Maybe it, it didn't quite happen that way, but, and yet, and yet we did, and yet we did meet our mortality. And yet we did realize Oh my goodness! I better tell you, I love you right mm, now. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it became the most important thing to say, "I love you" to to everyone, right? To let them know now. It just had that gorgeous urgency of, "Oh, I love you," and to be that overwhelmed mm. by how much we loved, by how capable we are, and how big that love is, how overwhelming and powerful that love is. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, it was definitely written for this time. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, right on. Uh, well, we're at the end of our little show here. <laughs> but can you give us one last poem? Uh, usually I ask people, oh, can you lead a little bit of a meditation or a breath thing or something? But how about a, how about a, a last little poem? poem? You bet. Hmm. How about this one? It um it starts with a a line from Hafez, a version by Danny Ladinsky, and uh, it, that poem is "Why just ask the donkey? Why just ask the donkey and me to speak to the donkey and you when I have so many other beautiful animals and brilliant colored birds inside, all longing to say something exciting and wonderful to your heart." And I read that poem and thought, yes, you know, of course I want to show up as a brilliant bird. And and, uh, and it felt great, of course, to think of myself as a brilliant bird until it didn't feel very true. And uh, this is, I guess, going back to what we've been talking about, but willingness to meet where we're really at, not just where we wish we were. <laughs> and uh, that's where this poem came from. It's called Precious Matter of Love. Dear, though I have come to you as many other beautiful animals, as long-necked swan, as Persian cat, though I have worn for you my most vermilion feathers and sung to you in the voice of the bird that always disappears just before it can be named, and though I've come to you as tigress, as heron, please do not refuse my donkey clumsy and stubborn, 
foul tug and gray and gray and dull and smelly of dung. Of course, you would want to turn away, but please, if you can, meet me this way. When I am awkward, stepping on my own feet and yours too. Meet me when I am unlovable. And love me then, though I stink. Though I am not easy, nor graceful, nor lovely but strong, and here I am nuzzling your hand as it opens and aspiring to be nowhere but here. Dear, we are nothing more than flesh for life to push through, and I'm done hiding inside the bright wings, or even, for that matter, beneath a dun hide. It's only a heart touches another heart. Here, here is mine. Mm. As they say in India, very good. Very good. <laughs> oh boy, thanks so much, Rosemary. It's been fabulous meeting you and hanging out. Best part of my job, I say to people. And uh, everybody, we're going to, of course, have show notes that will direct you to Rosemary's work and website and, and sign up for the daily poem. That is very great, too. And uh, we're, well, we're going to have to try and meet up again. All right. That'd be delightful. Sooner than later. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Uh, everybody, this is Mind Rolling, Raghu. I will be back next week. Meanwhile, go to beherenownetwork.com slash mind rolling. And uh, look, uh, as I said, you'll catch all of the links and, every, and all the ways in which to uh, uh, get familiar with Rosemary and her poetry. And you, we have this wonderful network. I know you all know that. Uh, and I'd love for you to um, meet up with a new podcaster, Mirabai Bush. is my longtime friend from way back with Ramdas. And she's doing some fantastic podcasts. And one recent one, and I unfortunately don't know the name of the person, but Rosemary, you would probably love this as well. Uh, somebody who is uh, um, an environmentalist, an advocate, and it's around the Ganges River in India, and with all of the implications of what that river means, way beyond just uh, the, the water source and so on, of course. Uh, so go to Be Here Now Network and catch it all. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.